everybody in the room. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joan uh, Yusinski uh, from the uh, Clinical Science Department. And um, uh, how he came to be invited was I saw an article that uh, uh, he co authored on uh, conspiracy theory and Zika virus. And when I saw Zika, that I had lit up because I've been doing work on Zika for quite a while or involving Zika one way or another. Um, and we talked, and the more I thought about it, and uh, Dan Messinger is the co leader of this interprofessional collaborative. Uh, we, Dan and I talked, and we thought this would be a very good topic for presentation, simply because conspiracy theories are having a greater impact almost on a daily basis on, on research, living research, as well as healthcare delivery of services. And so, without further ado, I welcome uh, Dr. John Yasinski. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, realizing that this is a, a uh, medical audience that, that presents two challenges for me, and one is to pitch it toward you guys, but the other issue is that when I do national polling uh, and find out who believes in the most conspiracy theories and who has high levels of um, conspiracy thinking, there are three professions that seem to come out um, with the least amount of it, and that is people who work for the government, people in the military, and people who work in big financial institutions. That's sort of ironic, because they're the ones that everybody conspiracy theorizes about. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe they're in those institutions, and they know we're not really up to no good. Um, but the professions where you have very high levels of conspiracy thinking are the medical profession, so maybe you'll hear some of the things I'm saying and be like, oh my God, he's telling me my sacred beliefs are false. Um, <laughs> but we'll find out. Um, so that's my name. I'm in the political science department. I've been here for about 12 years. Um, I'm an associate professor. Uh, most of my work when I started was on profit-driven news, and then I switched over to conspiracy theories around 2009. Um, it was an off-the-beaten path topic at the time, um, but everybody in the social sciences sort of jumped into it at that point, and it's been um, sort of, there's new papers coming out every day, um, trying to figure out why people believe what they believe. Um, is this going to work for me? Is this one? So, um, it started out as a research thing, I'm like, ah, this is funny, and then it became... Um, Try to space bar on the. Uh, this okay, now nice one. Oh, there's two. I met it in the. That was you? Oh, no. Go back. Okay, well. Um, so it became personal for me when I got married. So I live in Florida, so we said you have to get married at Disney. Um, and that was, that was about three and a half years ago. Um, great. Um, and then what happened was that she got diagnosed with cancer um, about two years into it. And we were apart at the time. I was teaching a class in London and she was here in Miami. Of course, she's freaking out. Um, so where did she go for answers? To Google. And um, I go to Google Scholar because I'm a professor. So I'm going to get very different things than she's going to get. Um, so whereas I get studies looking at survival rates by real doctors and real journals, and I can read that, um, she gets this crap. So powerful herbs and supplements, um, or if you slice onions and take them to your hands and feet, that will cure your cancer. Don't do any of the treatments the doctors want to give you, because those are poison and they will kill you. And that's the bulk of the stuff that she was finding. So... It's sort of difficult to say from across the sea. Don't look at that and say, you know, go to the American Cancer Society, go to the AMA, um, and get that stuff. Um, underlying all of the misinformation that's out there about what she had was a conspiracy theory. So it wasn't just wrong stuff. It was undergirded by this idea that uh, the real treatments are being hidden from you, and instead they want to sell you poisons that are, in fact, very bad for you. Um, so... Question here. Would the American Medical Association stop a cancer treatment with an 80% success rate? Yes, they would. And that 
that treatment is probably taping onions or eating lots of turmeric or something. Um, so luckily, she went here and got real doctors and real advice, and there we are getting getting her chemo treatment during Hurricane Irma, um, which I'll come back to a little bit later, and she's cured now, um, a few years later. Um, when we asked nationwide, is the AMA hiding the true cures for cancer, 65% um, of Americans say that they've heard of this conspiracy theory, and 35% believe it. So oftentimes I will hear from my students, well, don't you think they're hiding the real cure for cancer? Um, no. And there's another 30% of people who aren't sure if doctors are hiding the true cure or not. So there, there's a lot of people out there with either bad beliefs or they just don't have the right belief. Um, for the rest of the talk, I, I am going to touch on medical stuff, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about politics and how that plays in. Um, there are two things my mother told me not to talk about is religion and politics, so I would add conspiracy to the third. <laughs> the third one on that list. If you doubt me next Thanksgiving, bring up a few conspiracy theories after a couple bottles of wine have gone down and then see what happens. If you're invited back the next year, then I'm wrong. But my guess is you might not be invited back. Um, so um, I might sound a little bit dogmatic as I go through this, but I, I want to just tell you that my, my conclusions are based on a lot of surveys, a lot of analysis. Um, so to find out what people are thinking currently, I've been running surveys for the last seven years. Um, to look back in history to see what people have been thinking about over time, I've gathered about 120,000 letters to the editor of the New York Times to see what conspiracy theories people were talking about and when. And then to see what's going on on the internet, I look at Google Trends and I've been running Google Alerts um, for a long, long time now. Um, so just to tell you what we're talking about, a conspiracy is a real thing. It's a small group working in secret for their own benefit against the common good. Conspiracies, the way we talk about them, um, go beyond simple criminal acts. And we're talking about major attacks on our, on our bedrock ground rules or commit widespread fraud. Um, so it might not be illegal to hide a true cure for cancer, but it certainly would commit widespread fraud, right? Um, and these are real. When I say conspiracy, I mean something like Watergate, where we know it happened. There's real evidence out there, and anyone can see that evidence. So there it is, Watergate. So conspiracy theory has all these same elements, um, but it could be real. We're not, we're not sure. We don't know if it's totally false. We don't know if it's completely true, um, but it hasn't been verified by our epistemological institutions as, as being true. Um, and in many times, um, they're somewhat verified as being false, but what the conspiracy theorists do is they call into question the epistemological institutions. So like doctors say this is a cure for cancer. They say, well, the doctors are, are in on it. They're hiding the truth you are. Or climate change is fake. Well, 97% of climatologists say it's real. Well, they're in on it. That's how they get around um, the pronouncements of, of experts. Um, a conspiracy theory can explain past, present, or future events or circumstances. So it's not just things that happened in the past, like Kennedy, and it's not just big events, like assassinations. It could be um, explaining in income inequality, or um, why so many people get sick, or why so many people have autism, or why does a disease show up. Um, and it could be something that's not just happening in the past, it could be something happening now, it could be something in the future. Like I had a neighbor who was convinced that the New World Order was going to take away our dollars and make us um, use the Amero, which is a combination of the dollar, the American dollar, and the dinero. <laughs> it makes sense. It was going to be the Amero. And he's waiting for them to take his dollars and exchange them for the Amero. So it hasn't happened yet. Um, and it's a theory that appeals to a conspiracy to explain something. So if you believe uh, that the CIA uh, conspired to kill President Kennedy in 1963, then you're believing in a conspiracy theory. Um, we all believe in one, if not a few, conspiracy theories. There is no us in them. If we're going to draw a dividing line, I don't know where we would put that line, but it's clear that some people really believe a lot of conspiracy theories and have a strong worldview, where that dictates how they view everything. There are other people who are much more resistant to conspiracy.
conspiracy logic. Um, we can argue about where we would put that line, but, but for me, I mean, we all fall victim to this um, at one time or another and in one domain or another. Um, in the United States right now, about 60% of Americans believe in JFK conspiracy theories. Um, that's actually down from where it was uh, for decades, it was around 80%. 9-11 um, truth is sitting around 30%. It has been around 20% for, for the last decade and a half, but now Trump has been hinting at it. So that's given Republicans sort of the okay to buy into 9-11 truth theories. Um, if you think Barack Obama paid his birth certificate, um, you're one in five. Um, if you think that Zika is a hoax perpetrated by either the government or some other organization to poison us, um, you're again one in five. If you think that fluoride is some sort of plot either by communists to dumb us down and then take over the country, or um, by greedy corporations to poison us with stuff or money, um, then you're, you're one in 10. Now even these smaller conspiracy theories, even that one in 10 can be very powerful because they can be very loud and they can take over local meetings and they can dictate policy like they have in cities like Portland. Um, in Calgary, in Canada, they recently voted out the fluoride and comparing what was going on in Calgary from that time on with other cities nearby that were very similar but had fluoride, cavities through the roof, uh, particularly for younger and older people. So much to the dismay of the conspiracy theorists can get their way. Um, Four percent of this country right now believe in a conspiracy theory where lizard people rule the world. Um, this is a British guy named David Icke, who goes around and he sells out small, small uh, uh, arenas, and he talks about how everything is connected, and it all leads back to these shape-shifting, interdimensional lizard people. And people watch this show for 12 hours, and he invites them all up on the stage with him, and they dance away the evil power of the lizards. Evidence for this? I mean, he's written 12 books. People buy them, but you could see the scales on the Queen's neck that prove. <laughs> Or lizard heritage. <laughs> so people believe wacky stuff. Um, Florida is no different. Um, let's see. Uh, so in Florida, um, I can't see what I have there. Is there a way to move this bar at the bottom? Um, but I, I'll start you with this. So about 15% of people believe in about 15% of Floridians believe that the government controls hurricanes and they send the hurricanes here to get us. Um, now, the reason why I polled on this, that's all right, the reason why I polled on this was because um, as I was buying my supplies for Hurricane Irma, I was standing in line at Target and uh, the cashier said to me, Trump is doing this. <laughs> I said, Trump's doing what? He goes, he sends the hurricane. Yeah. And I said, wait a minute. First, I thought that she knew who I am. And I was like, <laughs> so you believe that the government can control hurricanes and then send, sends the hurricanes to get people? She's like, yep, yeah, he's doing it to us right now. This is, what, this is what this is. I said, wow. So I thought, maybe this is just stress getting to everybody. So I turned to the woman behind me. I said, you know, the cashier thinks that the government is sending the hurricane. He goes, what do you think? She goes, yeah, I, I believe it. She goes, I, I think Trump does stuff like that. I said, what do you do? She goes, I'm a school teacher. That's where the laugh stops. Um, we asked about the shootings at Parkland and at the Pulse nightclub, and we had about 20% who believe that those are false flag attacks perpetrated by the government to take away our guns. Um, so Floridians, Floridians believe a lot of these things. When we asked about immigration, do you think the government's hiding the true cost of immigration? Taxpayers, we get 45% in Florida, we get 55% in the US nationwide, and that's not just the Republican belief. Um, when we do it across the world, we wind up uh, with 60% in the UK, so immigration is on their minds there. When we ask a more extreme version across Europe, um, like the white replacement theory, which is what drove the New Zealand shooter to go and shoot up a bunch of people uh, recently at the Christchurch. We get 50% of French believing that that theory is true, that corporations and governments are conspiring to take a look, to get rid of white people, replace them with cheaper brown workers. Um, 
Why do these beliefs matter? I mean, if people want to believe goofy stuff, that's fine, but they matter because, um, you know, beliefs inform actions. Uh, when people vote based on this stuff, um, we're all stuck with the consequences if we make decisions based on conspiracy theories. Um, and right now, we're in a very polarized place. So polls on this show, that it's not just that we disagree with the political competition, we think they're evil. So in polls, we get 20% about for each of the following contentions. That Barack Obama is the Antichrist, that Hillary Clinton is a demon from hell, and this was accompanied by um, fake news going around on Twitter saying that she smelled like sulfur because she just came from, from hell. And Donald Trump is, is scarier than the devil. We get about 25% of that. 50% um, of, of Republican evangelicals believe he was sent by God. So very different uh, beliefs there. Um, occasionally, outside of the collective decision making, people will want to fight fire with fire. Um, so we have many instances that I could run down where somebody acts on conspiracy theory in a violent way. About three years ago, at a Washington, D.C. pizza place, a guy walked in trying to find the satanic uh, child molesters who were running this uh, sex trafficking operation, supposedly out of the basement of a pizza shop. And he went and fired off around, opened the closet, expecting to find the pathway down to save the children and instead found the room closet. They arrested him, sentenced him to four years in prison, and the judge said, you know, I appreciate you wanted to save the children from the satanic child molesters, but your, your bullet was four inches from somebody's brain. So, um, and I could, I could multiply examples um, going down, and in many of these instances, lots of people do die. Um, Tim, Timothy McVeigh's actions the um, basic model I use to explain these sorts of beliefs is that information laid over the top of a disposition leads to an opinion. Um, so this past election makes a pretty good example of this. So at the end of the Obama administration, unemployment was like 4.5%. And, and Democrats said, hey, wow, Obama, when you came in, the economy was a free fall, but now unemployment's really low. Hashtag, thanks, Obama. Republicans looked at that same number and said, you know, that number isn't really capturing what's really going on there, and worse, that number could have been faked. Hashtag, thanks, Obama. So same exact information, very different interpretations. And now that Trump is president, you, now the case is flipped. Now the Democrats say, wow, that unemployment number doesn't really mean anything. And, and Republicans say, well, the unemployment numbers are real now. People can get what they want um, with whatever information they're given. The model I'm going to show you um, is information getting laid over the top of two things, two predispositions that I care about. And one is conspiracy thinking, and the other is their, their political, their partisan identification. And um, those things together will lead people to have conspiracy beliefs. Um, so I'm going to construct a three-dimensional model for you. Very, very simple, um, but it'll give you a good way to think about who's who is going to believe in what conspiracy theories and when. Um, so our first dimension is conspiracy thinking, and on one end we have our high conspiracy thinkers, and on our other end we have our low conspiracy thinkers. Um, our left-right dimension is our Republicans on the right, our Democrats on the left. So very simple, and right there we have a two you know two-dimensional space where we can sort of figure out who's going to believe what. And then our third dimension is power. Who has it and who doesn't at any given time? So who are our winners and who are our losers? Um, so the first dimension is conspiracy thinking. Does anyone get the joke there? That we didn't ever have a no. Anyone see it? Oh, the moon's not yeah, that's the moon's not supposed to be there. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fake. <laughs> okay, so our first dimension is conspiracy thinking. So in my polls, I measure it with, with three, um, three questions that people can, can respond to from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And these are designed to get under the hood and sort of see their worldview. So our lives are being controlled by plots hatched in secret places, even though we're in a democracy. A 
few people always run things, and the people who really run the government aren't known to the voters. So I take these the responses to these questions, and I sort of get a score for each respondent. Um, if you look at how people respond from strongly agree to strongly disagree, most Americans are somewhere in the middle, but they somewhat agree with these. Now, it doesn't matter so much whether you think those statements are true or not. What matters is that there's variation among how people um, view those statements. And these are highly, highly predictive of people's other beliefs. So people who strongly disagree with those statements, um, when we give them a question that says, here's 10 groups, pick out all the groups you think are conspiring against us right now. The people on the low end of the scale will pick maybe one. People on the high end of that scale will pick between five and 10. So that's sort of like, don't go out at night. Um, so there's, there's big differences between, between the people at the high end and the low end. So if I was to ask you to close your eyes for a second and say, who's that person who has a really strong conspiracy worldview? What does that person look like? Or I say, what's their gender? What would you say? Yeah. It's, a, it's a, a dude, yeah. Uh, what color are they? White. White guy, what age? Middle. Middle-aged guy. And what other politics? Probably a little bit off the beaten path. Maybe conservative, maybe libertarian. That's All those things are me, which is frightening. Uh, so white, male, middle-aged, conservative. Um, and that's sort of what you get if you go onto YouTube. You get the Alex Jones types and a bunch of those types. But the, what the survey data tell is a very, very different story. And that is that conspiracy worldviews cut across gender almost exactly evenly, race, age, party, and, and political ideology. Um, and just to give you a really good example of this, um, the View, which is a show by women for women, that's been running for about 20 years. Almost all the hosts espouse prominent conspiracy theories. Jenny McCarthy with her anti vax stuff. Whoopi Goldberg believes that people didn't go to the moon. And Rosie O'Donnell thinks that Jeff Fuel can't melt steel. She's a 9 11 truther. Um, I could go on with you hosts and their beliefs. Uh, better predictors of who has this conspiracy thinking worldview, um, wealth and education, people who make more money and who are more educated tend to believe in conspiracy theories less. The reason for this, we're not precisely sure. We don't know where the causal arrow is going. Um, if I get well educated, it could be that my conspiracy thinking has been driven out of me by my great professors. Um, or it could be that you know people who have strong conspiracy theories just are going to be pushed out by educational establishment. So if I had somebody who wanted to work with me and said, I want to do a dissertation on why 9-11 was an inside job, I'll be like, no, I'm not interested in doing that. Same thing with money. It could be that people who don't have it have to come up with a, a worldview to explain their, you know, why they're not doing so well. Um, on the other hand, if you're going to hire the head of a bank, are you going to hire someone who thinks that the Jews control the economy? No. Yeah. So it may very well be the case that just people with these views are being kept out of, of, of higher, higher paying jobs. So we don't know yet. But other things we do know is that people on the high end of our scale are more likely to accept violence. Uh, people who believe in a lot of conspiracy theories are less likely to see doctors put on sunscreen, uh, use fluoride toothpaste, uh, or do a whole lot of other activities that, that you think they, they probably should be doing. Um, our second dimension is partisanship. So party tends to color all of our political views. Um, it's not that people pick a party based on the issues of the party. Party is more ingrained in us, something we grow up with. And if I know what party you are when you're 35, I'm gonna get an 85% chance of knowing what party you're gonna be voting for when you're 95. And the world can burn in the middle and it doesn't matter. People are what they are. Right now they tell a lie in the media that is that, oh, 40% of the country is independent independence and they reject parties now, 40% of the country are just in the closet and they're lying to you and to themselves. When we ask a follow-up question and say, you know, we ask people self-identifying independents, 95% of them will then say what party they really belong to, and those people are just as partisan as the people who come out with it in the first place. Um, but, but partisanship, from that we can protect almost everything else that they, that they think. Um, the way this tends to work is that people tend to follow their political leaders. So if, if you're a Republican and Trump says something, you're going to listen to what he says and adopt that view, even if it goes against 
what you would think a normal Republican would think. Um, same, same thing with Democrats. They take cues from, from their leaders. Um, so the country isn't really that ideological, and they're not very much set on any political stances. It's just they're very amenable to listening to what their leaders say, and they will flip back and forth um, to listen to these cues. So it's very important that we make sure that our political leaders do not adopt conspiracy theories. Even more, we've got to make sure they don't adopt conspiracy theories involving medical treatments. And right now, we have state legislators across the country who are adopting weird conspiracy beliefs about the MMR vaccine. So luckily, Trump came out and said people got to get vaccinated, but you have lots of other Republicans right now, and Democrats somewhere too, saying, you know, MMR vaccines are sorcery. Don't get them. This is bad because people listen to their beliefs. Um, just, to, just to give you a funny example of this, uh, this is Herman Cain. He ran for the Republican nomination back in 2012 for president. Uh, he, he did not win, but he, he did make headlines for a couple weeks. Now, his claim to fame was that he was a successful CEO of Godfather's Pizza. Uh, so as people during the campaign started to put together the idea that Herman Cain, Republican Godfather's Pizza, um, they started to... to you know, get different views of Godfather's Pizza. Now, luckily, Harvard just happened to be doing a repeated brand survey during the during the uh, election or during the campaign, and what they found uh, was that Republicans started to like Godfather's Pizza more, and Democrats started to like Godfather's Pizza less. <laughs> of course, it's the same exact pizza, no matter who you are. They're not giving you different pizza, um, but the political predispositions that people had started to control their views of this sort of. That's hilarious then. Um, and that's that's how much this, this can affect us. That's how much people are are amenable to just changing views about stuff. Um, when we ask Republicans and Democrats, who do you think is conspiring against us? Um, Democrats believe the corporations and conservatives um, are out to get us. Those are Democrats in the blue. And Republicans in the red believe that liberals and communists are out to get us. So both sides equally think that the other side is out to get us. Um, so they're both conspiratorial. They just think, they just point their finger in, 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 in different directions. When we ask Republicans and Democrats, do you think the Freemasons, which is sort of a wacky thing, do you think they're out to get us? Um, about 10% of each party think the Freemasons um, are out to get us. So, so both parties equally susceptible to pointing fingers and to wacky beliefs. Um, and just going beyond party, um, are you guys familiar with this one with the Da Vinci Code? Yeah, so the conspiracy theory there was that Jesus followed children with Mary Magdalene, those children escaped and became the kings and queens of France, and now they're being hunted by the Catholic Church um, to cover up uh, Jesus' progeny. Uh, who believes this sort of conspiracy theory? What studies show is it's, if you're into New Age ideologies and all this sort of stuff, you're the people that buy into these theories who's not going to buy into Da Vinci Code conspiracy theories, this guy. <laughs> He's not going to think that that's true. If you're into football, um, you might be familiar with the idea that Tom Brady was deflating, or at least they say he deflated the footballs to cheat so that the footballs would be easier for his receivers to catch, and this became a big thing. Studies show it's very easy to predict who's going to believe this. Um, if you live in New England, um, you don't think you don't think that he cheated. If you live outside of New England, then you are convinced that he cheated. Um, so the good news here is that conspiracy beliefs are largely going to be limited in their reach to people who already have this worldview to accept conspiracy theories, and they're going to be limited by the fact that um, people are only going to adopt conspiracy theories that that match with what they already believe. So an interesting question is, why do so many people believe Kennedy conspiracy theories then? And this, this phony headline sort of suggests why, is that when we poll on Kennedy, we say, do you think there was a conspiracy or a cover-up? And everybody says yes, but they all have a different villain in their head. Um, so a lot of people in the CIA, it was Castro, it was the USSR, it was LBJ. Uh, but anyone can come up with anything they want, and that's why those numbers are so high. Um, our third dimension, then power. Um, so 
what we find is that going into an election, equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats think the other side is going to cheat to win. So when we ask if the other side wins, do you think it will have been likely that the other side cheated? And, and about 30% uh, of each party say yes, they're going to cheat. Uh, this number cuts in half after the election, because only the losers think that they were cheated. The winners say, no, everything was, was just perfect. Um, and both sides believe in these sort of election fraud theories. So Republicans tend to believe that it's millions of illegal voters showing up to cast ballots. Um, and Democrats believe that it's Russians hacking voting machines or people being not allowed to vote who should be allowed to vote. Um, so to get patterns over time, uh, we, I went to the letters to the editor of the New York Times and we read 120,000 letters. We picked out all the ones that had a conspiracy theory in them. And then we coded them by who was being accused. And our, our, our categories were right, left, capitalist, communist, and then foreign is the biggest one there. Americans love talking about uh, foreigners and foreign countries conspiring against us. And then government, because it's around 15% uh, media and other. Um, yeah, just looking at this, Trump's strategy of, of really talking about foreigners and foreign governments and, and, and immigrants just matches, you know, the things that Americans have been concerned about since the beginning of the country. Always concerned about those foreign invaders you know, coming to get us. So he tapped into something that was very long-standing. Um, if we look at this over time, so that's over the 120 years from 1890 to 2010. If we look at that, what's going on over time, what we find is that when a Republican is president, most of the accusations are accusing the right and capitalists of conspiring. When a Democrat is president, it flips so that the majority of the conspiracy accusations in our letters are accusing uh, the left and communists of conspiring. We see this over the last 30 years. When, when Bush was president, it was, he did 9-11, Blackwater, War for Oil, Cheney, Halliburton, all this stuff. As soon as Bush leaves office, all of that becomes socially and politically inert. And then it's Barack Obama fake the birth certificate. Barack Obama killed the kids at Sandy Hook. And all, you know, Benghazi. And, and as soon as he leaves office, no one cares. And then it's Trump conspired with Russia. Da, 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 da. So as power goes, um, so do the bulk of the loud conspiracy accusations. When people are out of power, when they are losers, they are more likely to share their conspiracy theories because losers have a strong incentive, right? Present victories lead to future gains, and losers have to be especially vigilant uh, to make sure that they don't lose again. Um, when, there's, when the country is under threat, so when there's a foreign war, like a major war, like World War I, World War II, or the Cold War, conspiracy theorizing about, about foreign, foreigners in foreign countries goes way up compared to when it's not. So what we conclude in the book is that the targets and timing of conspiracy theories tend to follow a strategic logic. They're there to manage perceived dangers. So because they are about defeat and exclusion, um, conspiracy theories are for losers. And I can only tell you how much conspiracy theorists love me saying that. So, um, but I mean it descriptively and not pejoratively. So, um, I'll, I'll just spend a few minutes talking about the last election, and then I'll, and then I'll, then I'll sum up by talking about the internet. So, why we are where we are now. So we had a candidate who entered the Republican primary against 25 more Republican and more qualified people. In order to win, he had to sort of circumvent the normal playing field and create a new playing field for himself. He did that by using conspiracy theories. So his conspiracy theories went on and on and on and on and on. If you boil them all down to one statement, it's that political American political elites have sold out the interests of regular Americans um, to foreign interests. And that was his message. Um, but this happened on the other side too. Um, oh, well, so when we were polling during the Republican primary, and that's Trump support, and that's Kasich there. So the Trump supporters are far more way up on our conspiracy thinking scale than a more supported a more mainstream candidate like Kasich. So we've got pretty strong evidence that the Trump supporters are a different kind of Republican. They're high conspiracy thinking Republicans. Uh, 
Um, but same thing with this fellow here. Um, he had one conspiracy theory, and it was that the 1% controls everything. They have agreed that there was no end. They're making it hard for you to survive. And um, just like Hitler used you know, contradictory conspiracy theories against the Jews to say they were both um, rapacious money capitalists and subversive communists, Bernie Sanders says the 1% is both free market gamblers and they've rigged everything. Can't be both. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. Um, and there was no economics textbook that you open and say, how does the economy work? Well, the 1% controls it. End of, end of book. Um, so it's phony. It's phony stuff. We can have reasonable conversations about income inequality, um, but this is not one of them. And he motivated his people with, with a conspiracy theory, too. And so what we found with support for Sanders was very much correlated with, for Democrats, with conspiracy thinking. Um, Sanders supporters much more likely to reject the safety of vaccines. And this makes sense. Sanders has had a long history of supporting uh, pseudoscience and homeopathy and stuff like that. So if we look at what happened in 2016 and go back to our bottle, you know, on the low side of our model, we have a low conspiracy thinker. So Hillary Clinton and all of these people were chasing after those voters. Um, these people down here are more likely to vote, more likely to donate money, more likely to volunteer for campaigns. That's who they tend to go after. And they leave these people at the top here, the high conspiracy thinkers, who are less likely to be very much involved in loan. Um, but if you can't get the people at the bottom, um, go after the people at the top, and that's where these guys position themselves. They were both able to get about 40% of the vote in their respective primaries, which makes perfect sense. Um, and Donald Trump was able to, to pull out the victory because all these people here at the bottom, all these Republicans divided up the mainstream Republican vote and left him with all those people. Um, so, he has every incentive to keep his coalition together, so he is constantly pushing conspiracy theories. He has to dance with the date who brought him to the prom, so he's going to keep doing it. Um, so now we sort of have Democrats incentivized to conspiracy theorize about him because they are out of power, and him incentivized to conspiracy theorize because that's his coalition, is a bunch of conspiracy theories. Um, this is laid on top of social media. Social media allows the stuff to travel farther and faster than ever before. Um, but I do want to put a little bit of caution on the effect of the internet. So I'll give you one example here. And this was put out by Alex Jones. And it, this came out a few years ago. And it said that the Ebola scare that was going on in Africa, that Africans were catching the Ebola, dying, getting buried, and then coming back to life as Ebola zombies, walking the earth and eating brains. Um, People were afraid of Ebola, uh, but the Americans have this thing for zombies, so I guess that sort of made perfect sense. Walking day. We, yeah, we love zombies. So. Um, so this was shared, I think, half a million times. As it turns out, that's not a real Ebola zombie. That's actually an extra from a Brad Pitt movie about zombies. So not real. Um, so, so we keep hearing these stories about this stuff going on on the internet. What's the you know what is the true factor? The answer is, it's, it's less than we think. Um, well, at least it's less than a lot of us have been led to believe. So there's no evidence that belief in conspiracy theories has increased since before the internet. And for example, belief in Kennedy conspiracy theories has come down 20 points since then. That's, that's one example. But there's no evidence that it's gone up, um, despite what the news tells us right now. Uh, most conspiracy theories that get on the internet die in the vine. Most don't wind up getting a following. Uh, websites like InfoWars are not highly trafficked compared to more mainstream news sites like the New York Times. So, last I checked, New York Times and American web traffic was ranked about 24. Alex Jones' InfoWars was ranked about 390. That's a big drop off. Um, the internet allows people to access authoritative information. So, when I was a kid and I got a sunburn, my grandmother would rely on village wisdom and she would rub me in butter. If you Google that now, the first thing that comes up is saying, don't. <laughs> don't do that. Um, so we don't have to rely on village wisdom anymore. We can get real information at our fingertips anytime we want. And we often forget that. I think it's just a cesspool of fake news. But in fact, it's, it, there's a lot of real stuff out there. 
Um, our ideologies still filter what we want to access and what we believe when we do access it. So we're not in conspiracy theories. If we're not into that, we're not going to go looking for it. Um, and if we happen to come across a conspiracy theory and we're not inclined to believe it, we're not going to believe it. Um, and for the most part, elites still drive our beliefs. And that's why it's very important that we elect leaders who are not going to kowtow to conspiracy beliefs. Um, so I'll give you a pretty neat example of this. So mindfulness, a lot of people are getting into it now. There's some evidence that mindfulness is a good thing. But for, for about a decade, people weren't sure if this mindfulness thing is just some California hip trend, or is it a real thing? Um, anyone can believe in mindfulness, right? So when we follow Google uh, searches for mindfulness over the decade, what we find is herd behavior. Some people get into it and they share and they share and they share. And you might have more and more people looking for mindfulness over time. Uh, with Barack Obama's birth certificate, you never have that. With conspiracy theories, you don't get that sort of hurting behavior. And we're often told that people just share these things and they go viral. The answer is they don't. Is that they tend to spike when elites say they're a big thing. So when the news was reporting on Barack Obama's birth certificate in 2011, um, largely because of Donald Trump, you get a big spike. When they talk about it before the election, you get a big spike. But that's it. You don't get that hurting behavior because it's only it's only people who believe in conspiracy theories and only Republicans who are going to buy into that thing. So it just doesn't hurt that well. Um, so that's it. I'll be happy to take any questions for a few minutes. Those are my two books, American Conspiracy Theories and then uh, Conspiracy Theories and the People Who Believe Them. And then if you like wacky stuff, um, follow me on Twitter. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Yes. My observation is seems that a lot of uh, followers of conspiracies are firmly planted in their beliefs. But going back to the United States, when they were trying to uh, determine whether impeachment was appropriate, uh, I remember reading that history said the Republicans were protective of Nixon, Democrats wanted to impeach him right now, until the Supreme Court said the tapes had to be released. And when the tapes were released, and all of the Republicans moved over to let's impeach now. Or at least most of them did. Yeah, he lost the support to Congress. Yeah, he lost the support. You know what? For the things that are clearly wrong uh, that we're dealing with today, with regard to conspiracy, would it take something really slapping you across the face and really obvious to get you to change your stance to you know what is truth, the actual truth? In the same way it did for the Republicans and the, uh, the release of the tapes back in Watergate. Yeah, so you used a phrase there that we have to be careful of. You said clearly true. It might be clearly true to you, mm -hmm. but it's not clearly true to somebody else because their worldview tempers what is clearly true to them. Those tapes were doctored. Yeah, right. so. so something else. Can make yeah, so even, yeah. even when all the, all the evidence on Watergate was very clear and you had admissions being made in court, the conspiracy theories went the other way. They said, well, this was just the Democrats and the Jews and the reporters and the lawyers all ganging up on Nixon. This was a conspiracy by them. And he still had 10% public support for Nixon. It should have been zero. But there was still one in ten people who said, yeah, I support him. So people, you know, people have a strong belief. They're not going to give it up. And the evidentiary bar will get infinitely higher as people's support for something goes up and up. I mean, we're all like this to some extent. You're not going to put a Jew and a Catholic in a room and have them come out and, you know, change each other's minds. Or a Democrat or a Republican and be like, oh, we've, you know, decided to compromise and meet in the middle. You know, an atheist and a... And, and a religious believer aren't going to go into a room and be like, well, we've got ten commandments and you have zero, why don't we pick five and go for it? <laughs> it's not going to happen. So, um, you know, people, people's beliefs that they care about are very sticky and it's very tough for evidence to, to move it. So I'll give you just one quick example. Um, Lenny Posner, who is an activist against conspiracy theorists, he lost his, his son, Noah, at Sandy Hook. 
And I've had a bunch of conversations with him over time. We do some media spots together. Um, before this happened, he was a hardcore conspiracy theorist. He believed in all sorts of 9-11 stuff and whatnot. He was really into it. And then he, after what happened to his son, he knew what had happened was real. And then he saw what the conspiracy theorists were doing, and he started to figure out their epistemology, how they came to their beliefs. And he could no longer hold on to his conspiracy theory, so he had to give them up. And he realized how fanatical some of this stuff could be, particularly when people started taking action against him. Um, so, but it doesn't always, you know, for him, it took him losing his son and being attacked by conspiracy theorists to sort of realize this. Um, but most people aren't going to get that sort of evidence, um, so they'll, they're able to hold on. To so, that. are you saying that the measles, uh, starting the measles epidemic again, and cases of measles will not change the minds of people who are against that? I think for, for people who have dug their heels in, good luck. No. You know, I, I don't want to say it's a lost cause. Or, you know, I'd like to. You know, one of the things I work on is how can we convince the people who don't want to be convinced. It's a tough job, but right now there's no there's no vaccine we can give them that will change their mind. And what we're looking at now, ironically, is called inoculation. So if we can get people get to people early enough with right information and discredit at that point any conspiracy theories that they might be exposed to, perhaps that will keep them on the right path. You know, if we get to them first, but it's 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 tough to do. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about how this these concepts could be how we could maybe utilize them in um, team building, whether it's in a lab or in a working environment. Because although I would hope that most of the people I work with aren't extreme conspiracy theorists, mm -hmm. the reality is, is as you say, those those beliefs are based in the fundamental beliefs that we are raised, right? And so I think. For many of us here, we work in large teams. Yeah. And so sometimes you have people who are, who are really kind of um, steadfast in, in, in the way that they believe something should should work. And, and um, when you're meeting a lab or you're meeting a group, often you have you run the, the effector of change, which people struggle with. So with all of your research and all your experience, what are what are some things that we could take back for, for team building or collaboration in science um, to kind of world teams in a, in a more positive way or, or challenge those steady beliefs that people have? So one thing that works sometimes is when you don't challenge somebody's overall worldview and you in a sense use their worldview against this more specific belief that they have. Mm -hmm. So a, a pretty good example of this is when a lot of Republicans believe that there were death panels hidden inside the Obamacare legislation. Mm -hmm. So if Democrats told them, there's no death panels in there, they actually doubled down and they to know, I mean, obviously you're telling me this, it's part of a cover-up, so it only makes me believe in death panels more. Republicans were giving up the death panel beliefs when they were told by other Republicans who they trusted that there were no death panels. So they said, it's not there, you don't have to worry about it. And at that point, their, their Republicanism wasn't being challenged. They had somebody who they could trust, and that was able to change their view. So if you, if, if you do it in a way that affirms sort of their larger predispositions, um, but use that against sort of the more specific belief that is causing problems, that can work. Now, I'm kind of thinking about a good example, as you're saying, is, is um, there are very strong beliefs that Millennials have against non millennials and non millennials have towards. I feel like that's a very common topic mm -hmm. right now in the workplace environment. Um, you know, where there's just these very strong beliefs that, that people above a certain age act a certain way and, and work a certain way, and people below a certain age do not. And those are common conflict challenges, and again, not just in medicine and science, but around. So, mm -hmm. could you maybe frame it with that a very relatable example? I'm not sure that I always have access to someone who can, who, who people will, who I can say, hey, get, get this, you guys have the same belief system, get my team to believe that, right? Uh, oh, gosh. Okay. So I don't work with any millennials. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Gen Xer. I'm sort of like, you know, when they put up, when they put up polls of different generations, yeah. unlike CNN, uh, um, you know, the, the World War II generation, 53% say this, baby boomers, 48% say this, and then... Millennials say this as if we don't matter at all. <laughs> yeah. uh, we don't care about these Gen Xers. Uh, 
Um, and, and I guess there's sort of reason for that because we're the smallest generation sandwiched in between two very gigantic generations. Right. Um, and, and we've sort of been forgotten about. I went to a talk by John Zaki, who's one of the top polling people in the country, and he did all this polling trying to compare different of these generations. And he came up with all these great things to say about millennials. And I said, well, is this the, the function of the fact that they're just young? or the fact that of where they are in their life cycle, or is it really something unique to them? And the thing is, there's no way to know right now. You have to wait for them to get older. Right. Like, Gen Xers like me were the least likely to vote when they were young. But every generation is the least likely to vote when they're young. Um, once you followed us over time, you found out that we really, truly were slackers, and we were the worst of all the generations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. So, so there you go. So, I mean, I mean, my view is it's very difficult to change minds. We have to know that, and we have to sort of temper our expectations. Um, authoritative information isn't always going to do it. If you're using authoritative information to push back on somebody's beliefs they really care about, we have the opportunity of actually making them double down. Um, so we can do more damage than good. Um, going across large populations, sometimes colorful figures actually change minds. They're finding some of this with climate change. If you show demonstrations of figures and plot stuff that's easy to understand and simple, but is a visual representation, um, that can change minds on certain things. Uh, but in terms of your personal relationships, I don't have an answer for you. I wish I did. I mean, my mother is a hardcore conspiracy theorist, and it's just sort of like, <laughs> and if I if I got a magic bullet to give you, I would have used it myself. Yeah. But there's, there's there's not there's nothing I can do. You know, I just don't I don't have an answer for that. So, yeah. What I'm kind of hearing is that there's a time intensity relationship between the strength of the belief and the specific theory. That you know, as time goes, then that belief becomes stronger. Am I perceiving that correctly? I think the longer something's ingrained in you, um, the tougher it is to, to be dislodged. Um, so, for example, like both of my mother went to high school in the seventies, and I went in the late eighties and early nineties. My history teacher, her history teacher too, said JFK said it was a conspiracy. He was killed by the CIA or whatever. Or something like that. And if you're taught that, it's not a conspiracy to you. It's just this is what the history teacher told us. This is true history. Mm -hmm. um, Good luck dislodging that over time because you're changing sort of, you know, a fundamental thing that a person was taught early on. Um, good luck dis dislodging like religious beliefs from somebody. You're not going to be able to do that because they were taught from an early age and, and, and it was sort of in their entire bubble. Everything supported this, this belief they have. Good luck prying that away from them. And you're not going to be able to do that. Um, and so you're right. I mean, when you, when somebody gets hit with a conspiracy theory, and they're exposed to it, and they accept it. Um, the longer they're on it, the harder it is to dislodge. Even if they sort of give it up, they're never going to fully return back to saying I completely disagree with that. You know, they just won't support it as much, but they'll still have a little, a little bit of it there. I mean, if, if, if you guys are concerned with things like vaccines or conspiracy theories about medical treatments, I think it's incumbent on doctors. Like one thing that I hear about is that doctors won't treat people. So if you're not going to get vaccinated, I don't want you in my office. Like I, I seem to think that that's a pretty good um, strategy, or just making sure that doctors are communicating this um, to their patients early on. Because I think in some ways, you know, like my grandmother, she knew what measles did, and polio, and all these things because she saw it. 20s and the 30s, um, but for people born in the 70s and 80s and 90s, they haven't seen these massive outbreaks. They don't know what polio or the, these other things are, so they're like, "Oh, you know, that's not a real problem. I don't have to get vaccinated because it doesn't exist." Well, having doctors tell them this is a real danger, you have to do this, and if the doctors trust them, then people are going to trust the doctors. So people have to cash in on the, on the trust, trust them. Actively sort of make the case for them because it's not getting made. And there's no lived experience that these people have with vaccines that can make them believe it. They have to be told. I mean, 
mean, we're not going to change minds for the hardcore anti-vaxxers, but we, we can help prevent um, the people who might be scared about autism or the people who might have heard something on Dr. Oz, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> I have a question, kind of on the same line. So we hear all the time about, um, like in the news and in the media, about people being radicalized, right? Like, and it seems like it happens very easily. You know, they go somewhere for a week and suddenly they're radicalized. Like, and so thinking about it again in this kind of context of medicine, um, you know, A, is that true? Is it very easy to radicalize a belief like that you're doing that, about anti-vaccination or something, right? And, and is it as easy within a certain time frame to to recalibrate that thinking back as it is to? Do you yeah, I yeah. do perfectly. Um, I don't. The answer is I don't know. <laughs> um, it does happen that people get radicalized. Um, it can be, but generally, what it is is that the, the, the person is either sort of blank slate, they don't have any views on anything, they're sort of searching for something, or they're already disposed to that set of viewpoints anyway. So you see it with religion, you know, where people will be, oh, I'm sort of a Catholic, and then they wind up becoming something far more radical, um, because they meet somebody, something happens, and then it sort of leads them down this path, mm -hmm. and they put themselves into an information bubble where it's the same stuff, all reinforced with the same stuff, and it's, it's, they're stuck in it. It's really tough to pull them out. We see this with the QAnon believers right now, um, where everything they're accessing just shows how right they are. Even when they're completely wrong about everything, they're always right, and they're just getting reinforced inside this bubble. So they live in a separate world, right? And it's sort of funny that it's like they're doing the same exact thing that you were doing. Right. You're immersed in academic journals, you're reading the peer-reviewed stuff, you have evidence-based things, but they think they're doing the same thing too. Everything is based on evidence and this and that, and they, they know that the satanic child molesters are out there right now because everything they have at their disposal shows them the evidence is there. It's just their epistemology is bad. It leads them to pick really bad evidence. So, um, to peel them out, I don't know. I don't know. I know that there are people who, who go after, they'll get the cult members and then they'll deprogram them. Um, I'm not that familiar with that or, or, or how to do it. Um, so, we'll see. One of the things I've seen through the ages is that if something very dramatic and very personal happens, that, that can be a wake-up call. And usually something pretty bad that happens to them, it makes them sit up and realize that maybe I was wrong in how I was approaching this belief. You would like to think that, um, but there are people, like parents, who reject modern medicine, and the kid will die of something that could have been cured very easily, like a blockage or something like that, kid backs up and dies, sepsis or something, um, and then they let it happen again to the next kid, the next kid dies. And you think that the kid dropping dead or something that could have been cured would have changed their mind and their outlook. Yeah, it doesn't do it. So for some people it does, I gave you the example of Lenny Posner, uh, but for other people, I mean, there are numerous examples of families that, that just reject medicine. It doesn't matter how many kids die, they're gonna keep doing their thing. Um, with the QAnon, it doesn't matter how many predictions that this Q thing makes that keep coming wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong, but the beliefs only strengthen. You know, so it just, um, it's not, you know, you would think, dead kid, maybe it's time to start going to doctors, but for them, the evidence just shows them something else. So whereas dead kid means to you, go to a doctor, it might mean something else to them. And they interpret it in their way, and they can use they can use motivated reasoning to make it mean whatever they want it to mean. So if their priors are that strong, they can twist anything into what already supports what they believe. So I'd like to say that people were better at uh, reasoning and, and whatnot, but you know they're not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>